Thanks very much. I'm, I'm very happy and very excited and, and a little intimidated to be here, honestly. Um, you know, I was going to start off with that line from uh, Lord of the Rings. I, I don't you know half of you half as well as I should like, but man, I'm not even going to attempt that now, but it's all true. Um, so just a little bit about me to get started. Um, as Tim said, I've been doing uh, games and game design professionally since the uh, mid-1990s. Actually, my first paper role-playing system in the mid-1980s. I still have it on PDF, and it's one of those things I used to sort of help keep me humble, because I look back and it's like, oh, oh, no, no, that was, no, that was not a good idea. But I've worked on a bunch of different uh, games and game-like things, uh, a fair amount of artificial intelligence, a uh, 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 psychological uh, personality profile. Um, the last couple things up here are a, a book on, on game design that I uh, wrote and published uh, last year um, and from which a lot of this talk comes. And then the final thing is, um, and this is me really tempting fate, um, is Our Town, which is my paper prototype uh, for my semi-cooperative build a town together game, uh, which yes, I have with me. And I thought, well, that'd be great. I'll bring it with me. And now I'm like, what was I thinking? <laughs> um, so hopefully we'll have time to talk about some of that later. So systemic game designer, as one of my students said, systemic what now? Um, I should say just on, on the university side, I am teaching and, and I, I, uh, uh, the director of the game design program at Indiana University. I've been there for four years and I've learned a lot about refining uh, how we talk about game design, how we teach game design, how we do game design um, based on my time in, in the industry. Um, and so that's where, where a lot of this is coming from. What I'm really trying to do is to, is sort of the, the longest term, is to get past just ad hoc game design. There's a lot of stuff that um, I've done in games where it's, which is like, we don't know, let's try this out. Oh, that didn't work, let's try this other thing. Okay, that didn't work, we'll try this. I think we're at the, on the cusp of having some game design theory and that, that can really is broadly, broadly applicable game design theory and I, and I hope that this uh, works for that. This talk as a result is fairly theoretical, fairly theory oriented. I did try and, and bring some nuts and bolts in it so it wasn't all drifting up here. Um, but I think there is a time for us to think more deeply about game design. This does, my point of view primarily comes from, from video games, but I, I think it all applies to tabletop and I, I put in some specific tabletop things in this talk. Also, there's a saying I love. There was an actor who, um, talking to other actors, said movies will make you famous, TV will make you rich, theater will make you good. And to my mind, tabletop gaming, tabletop game design is the theater of game design. That's where the really the rubber hits the road. I can't hide behind flashy explosions or great shaders or an obscure combat system. There's a lot of stuff going in that, that puts out a three or a four. It's got to be right there. And if it's not right there and the players don't get it, then the game isn't any good. So I, I love that, and I think there's a lot we can build on there. Um, not sure where to aim this thing. There we go. So uh, about games and systems, um, I spent a lot of time um, thinking about, and, and before I started writing about games and systems and what game systems are, uh, Paul Stefan, a uh, great game designer, said about, what, I was asking, what is a systems designer anyway? And I got lots of different answers. His answer was, a systems designer can turn a spreadsheet into a game and a game into a spreadsheet. And I think there's some, some real truth to that, but I think it, it, goes, it goes well beyond them. That, that's a great starting point. The thing is that systems and game systems both are, are at best kind of vaguely defined. There's lots of different kinds of systems we see in games, but there's really no way to enumerate them all. And people have tried uh, to enumerate um, all the different kinds of systems you could have. And this is where I say I think we're edging up on some theory that I'll talk about here. The thing that I really came to, though, is that games are systems. That you, there is no game, I'll just make this an absolute statement, and I'm sure I'll get criticism, that's great. Uh, there is no game that does not have systems in it or that cannot be expressed as a system when you, when you boil it down. There are systems that aren't games, but I do think there's this wonderful reentrant, uh, games are systems, systems are games uh, kind of relationship there that, that really informs a lot of what I do. So what's a system? Uh, to try and, and, again, boil this down as much as I can, um, this is, uh, a lot of this is, is really a, rapid talk going over the wave tops of some, some deeper material, but I think uh, hopefully this will be useful. So if you have some, you have independent parts, uh, and you can think of this as game pieces, you know, chess pieces is a great example, where each of those parts has behaviors that affect each other. So those parts are connected by their behaviors. So you have chess pieces and how they move. Those are the behaviors. That's, that's the first part, the, the parts of a system. Um, these then create um, loops by mutually affecting each other. And this is a really important part. When you have parts that, that affect each other that don't loop, 
that's where we have, in a pure sense, a narrative or what's often called a, a, a complicated system rather than a complex system. Uh, one of the examples that's used a lot is launching a rocket to the moon is a very, very complicated process. But it's not a terribly complex process. What happens when the third stage burn doesn't go back and affect the first stage burn? The first stage definitely affects the second and third stage. So same thing with a book. You have a series of narrative arcs, but you don't have the, the loop that goes back and affects it. And this is one of the hallmarks we see in all kinds of systems in um, not just game systems, certainly, but in natural systems and economic systems and social systems. There's a great video, by the way, that I, that I tend to use on the first day of my class uh, called How Wolves Change Rivers. Um, if, you, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to look it up. I'm talking about the, the reintroduction of, of wolves into Yellowstone and how they had a very systemic effect uh, on, 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 uh, on Yellowstone. So these um, mutual effects uh, create loops. And these loops then create an, a new whole experience. So when you have something that's bound together in a looping kind of way, you get this, this really interesting whole experience, which in turn leads to a, the ability for systems to have hierarchy. So you have systems within systems within systems, where each of these parts, each of these, these individual circles, may itself be a system, which has systems inside it and systems inside it. So you get a lot of these things, and um, believe me, I can go on about this. Uh, this goes all the way down into protons from protons to galaxies and, and on. Um, so in terms of tabletop games specifically, like I said, we have the parts, which are the game pieces, and they're the actions that they take. Um, these then lead to really interesting interactions where we get looping systems. So this is a chessboard, and I am not a great chess player, but I did look up an interesting chessboard. Any, any chess players in here? Okay. This, this is uh, two moves to a checkmate. Um, I don't see it because I don't know the loops but there's the, the, there are relationships between each of these pieces here that put the board to a very particular state, um, as opposed to just being a random assortment of, of pieces on there. What that leads to is the, the whole or the experience of the game, which is you win or you lose. You, you, you have um, moments where you think you're gonna lose and you pull it out and you win, or a strategy that doesn't work out. Um, and this is true for all games where we have these, these parts, parts, loops, and holes, I'll be talking a lot about that, um, that are the, the, the sort of the core of, of systemic game design. So just to, to give some examples of this from, from um, other games, uh, Love Letter, um, I love, I guess I can say that, uh, because it is so uh, distilled. It's 16 cards, each number is one to eight. Um, you have a hand of one card and you draw one, you play one. That's about as simple as you can get, I think, with, with a hand. Um, and then each, the, the, the behaviors, these are the parts of the system, each, each part, each card, has a specific behavior that gets applied to the other cards. And they start, they affect each other over time, and that's how you get um, the loop in here. In terms of the, the player's loop, there is the draw one, play one, and a sub-loop of what, you know, which one am I gonna play because I wanna use this ability or that ability. Um, and the players use, uh, decide, to use how you, how, decide how to use these cards. And then the whole of this thing, the whole experience is one of bluffing and outlasting. And there's another part to this as well, another aspect of the, of the whole, which is that it's very, very fast. One of the reasons I love teaching Love Letter is it takes five minutes to teach it and five minutes to play it. And people say, great, let's do that again. So there's, there's now this outer loop of let's do that again. Um, that, that's extremely effective. Um, Splendor is another uh, game that I really like. Um, the parts, you have the, the cards, the coins, and the patrons. Um, this is a great example of an engine building game. I'll talk more about that in just a moment, minute here, where you're using the cards to, you buy cards that give you more uh, gems so that you can buy more gems uh, as they go forward. Uh, the coins are also, are also gems. Um, there's a secondary loop here of building victory points, which when I play it, I often tend to forget uh, because I'm so intent on building this lovely engine. It's like, oh, right, winning the game. And my wife's, you know, so, you've got 10 points? I have 23. Oh, right. I should play this game differently. Um, Splendor is wonderful in part because it's so pretty. Uh, the, the art is really wonderful. The heft of the coins is something that a lot of people talk about and really does make a difference. Um, it is a very strong example of an, of an engine system. At the same time, there's an interesting gap, and I use this, this game in my classes a lot because like one of my students said, I don't really feel like a game merchant when I'm playing this. There's an interesting thing going on here, but it feels kind of dry, kind of analytical. And so we actually spent some time talking about what's missing. Honestly, I don't know that I have a complete answer to this yet. I think there's something almost alchemical about this in terms of the kinds of interactions we have, which again, I'll come to in a moment here, 
about um, why something feels, like why Seven Wonders feels to me in a very, very abstract way, like I'm building uh, an, an ancient civilization where this doesn't make me feel like I'm, I'm being a gem merchant. Power Grid, when I introduced my Power Grid to my family, I said, this is great. This is a game about building the German electrical system. And my kids were like, ugh. <laughs> and it took, it took less than a whole game. They're like, okay, we have to play this again. So that, that to me is, a, is a, really good, uh, um, a really good sign. At the same time, back to, I think it was Ryan talking about, when does the, when does the gameplay start? It starts at least when you're seeing the box and there's the nice guy in the white lab coat on the front. And again, my kids are like, you know, why are the colors so muted? Why is this like, oh, dad, really? Um, but this game is so cool. This game has so many interacting systems in it. How you determine turn order, um, how you bid on things. My wife is a killer at bidding in this game because she can say, well, she says like, she does this whole logic of like, I'm not going to bid on the one that I want. I'm going to do that so other people buy it. So that by the time it, you know, by the time it gets to the end of my, my time, I can just choose the one I want. She's very, very good at this, much better than I am. Um, there's also things like uh, just a little mechanic of, of burying the highest card, which, which, so the card that doesn't get purchased gets buried under the deck, which means at the end of the game, you've got a whole bunch of high value cards there. It's a very simple little mechanic. It's a nice little subsystem of the game um, that's very effective. Um, one of the things I like most about this game, though, is the, the fuel market. This uh, creates a really nice little um, elegant supply and demand system. Um, and it supports the overall player experience with what's uh, an ecological system, which, again, we'll talk about here in a minute, sort of define that. But just the idea of, like, you know, you're buying all the oil. You're buying all the oil because you know I want it. Yes, I am. Uh, and it, there's a really nice supply and demand. If anyone hasn't here hasn't played Power Grid, boy, howdy, do I recommend this game. Um, but it's, it's got a lot going on, it's, it's, it's a, a great one. Um, here we go. Okay, so let me sort of zoom back out a little bit to uh, define some of these things. So I've talked about parts, loops, and holes. Systems are made of parts, I think we, we get that part. Um, but the way they make loops is, is interesting and worth looking at. So there's two basic kinds of loops, reinforcing and balancing loops. Sometimes it's called positive and negative feedback, but there's some problems with that terminology because you can have a um, reinforcing loop that's reinforcing something as a negative, like, like pollution is a reinforcing loop. You, have, you can have toxicity that increases. So uh, looking at something, is, is the, uh, the quantity increasing or is something coming to a balance point um, is, is how we look at these loops. And these can then, these can make innumerable different kinds of structures. Um, two of them here, uh, rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock um, is a, a great example um, and almost the same but not quite is the ancient Chinese alchemical system that has five quantities that either create or consume um, others. Um, this turns out, by the way, uh, th these uh, uh, intransitive loops, um, you can build these of any size as long as you have an odd number. So this is like a game mechanic waiting to happen, I think. Um, you could build one of these with 100, I think one person has, in fact, built them with 101 um, aspects, 101 parts in it. The rule is they have to always beat half and always be beaten by the other half, which is why it has to be an odd number, because there's me plus two others, me plus three others, me plus nine others. Um, so within um, game design, in terms of thinking about systemic game design, we're not just looking at looping systems within the game. That's the first part of it. But we're also looking about with the loops that are happening inside the player. So in fact, I have these here. So loops within the game is our first part. And then we have loops that are going, what's going inside the player's head? And then this is where the, the game really kind of hits the, becomes a thing, is where we have the, the loop created by what's going on inside the player's head, what they do to chain, make a change in the game, which then makes another change inside the player. So you have this level of loop. And there's one more, which is as a game designer, I am thinking about and working on having my own loop in my own head about the interaction between the player or players and the game. So there's multiple levels here. I'm going to talk about each of these just a little bit. So within the game itself, we have different kinds of loops. Um, a number of different people have defined these. Uh, I've tried to boil these down uh, to sort of, the, again, the most um, archetypal that I can. Um, so um, engines are basically about using a resource where you can, you have a resource, you can either use it now for a certain benefit, or you can reinvest it to build up that benefit later on. That's very, very common. You see this in lots and lots and lots of different games. Um, and this can be, um, 
either reinforcing or balancing. So you can have um, uh, engines that increase or engines that, that, that balance or decrease them off. Um, but again, this is the, a very common one. And I realize these are abstract, um, but unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to, to really dig into the, the details of each of these. Um, an economy is often uh, built on an engine or, or incorporates engines, but it has an exchange between two or more resources to create some greater utility. So with an engine, you're just investing or spending a single resource. With an economy, you are taking two or more resources, exchanging them to create greater utility. Um, typically, there's a primary reinforcing loop, and as there is here, there's a little engine on the left here. So this is basically, you have workers who can cut wood, uh, sell the wood for bread, which allows them to cut more wood, or you can take some of that wood and, uh, um, uh, and build a, 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 use it for lumber, which then allows you to actually create even more wood. Um, so you have the, the, it's the exchange part of the wood for bread that makes this um, an economy. Uh, and you can chain economies uh, a lot, so you can have this really sort of arbitrary complexity. Um, so you can have something going from like ore to steel where there's an exchange at each step along the way and there are decision points along the way and balance points along the way. Lots lots of game design that, that goes into this. This actually has uh, a secondary path, which is I have workers, I can actually, I can train, I can change those workers and exchange them in effect um, by educating them, by making them more skilled workers to enable the latter, the latter part of my economy here. Um, and there's ecologies. Ecologies differ from, from economies and again, you have two more resources but in this case, they're not, um, you're not increasing value, you're balancing them off. So this is, uh, I mentioned the how wolves change rivers. This is actually part of that. Um, you have deer, wolves, and plants. Uh, the plants eat the, excuse me, the deer eat the plants. Not, not that's a different game. Um, <laughs> the deer eat the plants, which, which increases the deer and decreases the plants. They're balancing each other that way. The wolves eat the deer. There's a same, similar balancing relationship. And at some point, the deer and the wolves both die, which to sort of complete the circuit, makes soil, in effect, which increases the plants. Um, and then within this, you can sort of zoom in to what's happening with the deer and just view that as its own subsystem where um, they have a, a primary balancing loop by exchanging external resources. And again, I don't have time to get into this, uh, the questions of when is something internal or external to the, uh, to the system or to the subsystem, but there is some, uh, the, the boundary conditions for a system is actually a, a really interesting point in, in game design as well. Uh, then, of course, you can combine all different, these different kinds of systems. So this is a really abstract view of a typical role-playing game where the overall uh, loop here is a, a reinforcing loop of my character is becoming more powerful. Uh, but along the way, I have a skill engine where I can either use points or invest them. Um, I have um, an item economy, especially like if I have a, um, an inventory system, like in uh, Diablo, I don't know what the rest of you with video games, I spent far too much time playing inventory Tetris. Uh, trying to get things to fit. Um, and that is a kind of ecology because the, 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 the balancing or limiting factor there is the amount of space I have. Um, and then you have, um, there's a role economy potentially where if we've got different people with different roles. Um, and then um, a combat ecology where the, the, in the most abstract terms, the monsters are trying to balance us, you know, the players, and the players are trying to balance the monsters and that we're trying to kill each other. Uh, but by looking at this, at, at really taking an abstract view, you can say, oh, right, I see how I can incorporate these systems into, into different games that I design. So that's sort of all within the game. And I realize this is going quickly. Um, feel free to watch the video later on half speed. Um, within the player, then we sort of move from within the game to within the player. We talk about um, how do we get the loops going inside the player. And again, I spent a lot of time looking at this. There's a psychological definition of engagement which incorporates these three qualities of vigor, dedication, and absorption. Do you, are you willing to put energy into it? And this comes right down to, am I willing to open the box? You know, am I willing to set up the game? Uh, I'm willing to set up Twilight Struggle. Not everyone is. On the other hand, I don't know if in this lifetime I will ever set up War of the Ring again. My, that may be beyond my vigor threshold. Uh, but am I willing to, to put the, the vigor and dedication both? Am I willing to, to put the energy in and stick with it? And then do I become absorbed by it? If I'm getting my phone out, then I'm probably not as absorbed by the game as, as the designer might want me to be. Um, and these, are, these three characteristics are things we see across any kind of activity um, from, I mean, from playing games to flying an airplane or performing surgery. Um, this curve here is the Yerkes dodson uh, curve. This comes from early 20th century psychology talking about um, as, the, um, your, as the task becomes more difficult and as you become more psychologically aroused, um, to use that difficult term, uh, how does your performance do? And, and you know, we all get better and then we fall off. And there is a lot of variations on this, but that's the, the basics of this. 
Then, of course, there's uh, uh, Csikszentmihalyi's flow, which a lot of you have probably heard of. And you can think of the, the Yerkes-Dodson curve as being sort of a slice through this, where this is saying as, the, as my skill increases, as the difficulty increases, there's a zone in which I am in flow. I'm, I, I'm, I'm in the game. I'm loving the game. Or I'm loving whatever it is I'm doing, um, as opposed to dropping off into apathy or feeling too stressed or too bored. Um, all these have to do with engagement. And just because I saw there's a talk on, on meaning of fun, we'll talk about this. Um, my own definition is that if you have these three things and you have a positive emotional experience, and which requires some definition, that's fun. You can have games that, that engage you that aren't fun. There's a lot of them out there. Um, to my mind, I don't think you can have a game that, and you can have things that have a positive emotional experience, cotton candy, whatever, but it's not terribly engaging. But to really have experience of fun, you need to have both of these things. So in the sort of sub-basement of engagement, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, it is important to understand that this comes from our brains, um, the things that, that um, help us focus on what we're doing. Uh, I'll talk here in a minute about different kinds of, of attention, um, but it, especially the reflexive attention where you can't not look at a, a flashing light or bright color or something that, that neurologically draws your attention. Um, so, so our brains are set up for this to say things like with dopamine, I just did a good thing, let's do that again. Um, there's a great scene in Shrek where they, they have this donkey said, let's do that again. That is dopamine right there. Um, but so these, uh, these are the, the primary uh, neurotransmitters that, that are sort of like sorry, the, the sub-basement of our, our, our engagement psychologically. Um, moving up from there, we can look at different aspects of human psychology. Um, and I'm going to go through very quickly here, uh, but going from the perceptual to the cultural. Um, and what all these do is help build the player's mental model of the game. If, if I am looking at a game and I can't build a mental model of it, if I'm not engaged by it, I'm not going to play it. If the rules are too wonky, that you know, there's too many exceptions or too much going on, or if I have no context for this, uh, again, I'm, I'm probably not going to enjoy it very much. The first time I played uh, Twilight Struggle with my then teenage son, about, I don't know, three or four turns in, he's like, wait, this stuff really happened? This is a game about those of you who haven't played. It's a game about the Cold War that uses real events. And he was suddenly much more engaged by it because he had his, it's like his mental model really took a shift uh, to say, oh, now I understand more about this game. So the thing about making games systemically is that we think systemically. We look for systems all around us. And this is how this helps us make um, better games that are more easy to, easier to learn. Um, so in terms of tabletop interactivity and, and building a player's mental model, um, there's a, a patterns that I see that are a lot where you have uh, what's been called multiplayer solitaire, where um, you know we're all playing the same game together. Um, well, I just had a game. There, I'm, there's many examples of this, and one has just fled my head. Um, but we're, we're, we're not really playing with each other. We might be playing a little bit, but not a lot, versus games we're playing more with each other and with the game. I mentioned Seven Wonders earlier. Uh, in Seven Wonders, one of the neat things I like about it is you can play with it. You play with the players on the other side of you, but aren't generally affected by people across from you or you know, beyond one away from you. Although we have a house rule where you can spend more money to trade with people further away, so you can, you can twist these things around. But especially in tabletop, where you don't have a computer working for you, where the player is the computer, the game defines the parts and the behaviors and it maintains the general state, and the players themselves are, are what uh, keep the game going. So this then takes us to these, the, the idea that the loops that exist between the player and the game, where what the, what the player does, the player forms an intention, says, I want to try this out in the game, does that to the game, that changes the game's state. In a board game, that might just be moves a chit one place to the right. The, the uh, game then sends feedback to the player, state on the board, which changes the player's intentions. The trick here being that if either the player state or the uh, game state is trivial, like in a game like tic-tac-toe, then there's not really much game there. And yet, having hidden state in a game becomes really interesting. We come up with really fascinating solutions just like Kanabi where the hidden state is, I can't see my cards. I can see everyone else's cards, but not mine. So there has to be some amount of non-trivial isomorphism uh, between what the player thinks is going on in the game and what's really going on in the game to keep this loop interesting. Um, so we can, as I mentioned before, we have the, from the perceptual to the cultural, we can look at these, these loops varying in uh, duration, length, uh, tension type that we apply to them, how urgent they are, and what kind of resources they require. And that turns out to have huge effects on how players interact effectively with the game. 
So you can look at this as if each of these loops is from the player to the game and back again, we have very, very short uh, loops that can be called perceptual or action feedback loops, uh, short-term cognitive, long-term cognitive, social, emotional, and cultural. Each of these takes longer and longer and longer amounts of time. And one of the things we see that I think I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in just a second is that um, one of the interesting things is that the shorter loops are more um, psychologically and intentionally urgent and they drive out the longer loops. And we'll see the effect of that here in, in just a minute. Um, so we have, just to, to go through these quickly, um, action feedback interactivity is huge in video games. If I can put flashy colors on the screen and explosions and shooting and things like that, then I don't have to worry about much else as a game designer. I don't have to worry about why you're playing it, what your goals. I don't have to worry about these things a little bit, but um, there's a, a wonderful little game called Boomshine, which is a one-click-per-level game. Um, and it's all very pretty. It, you have pretty expanding circles on the game. There's really not much more to it than that. But it doesn't need a lot more because it has that very fast cycle. Um, with tabletop, of course, we don't really have that. If someone comes up with a way to do explosions in a game, I'd love to hear that. Um, but it is more about uh, component art and quality, the, the, the juiciness um, of, the, of the game, um, and how it appears to us and how that works with how we're playing the game. Um, this this ex experience, sorry, contributes more to the experience than strictly to the gameplay in most cases, though there are certainly are exceptions. Um, so just a, a few examples, I mean photosynthesis, just the artwork on this is beautiful. Above and below, near and far, I don't know where I'm looking in the audience. Again, beautiful, beautiful games. Um, this one, the, the components are, are trees that just has a beautiful feel to it. Um, so even though these aren't doing anything, there's not a real strong loop in terms of, of me perceiving something in, in the game, giving me some feedback, um, as there are in video games, this just adds a lot to the, the ambiance of the game. Uh, this is uh, Zulkin, um, which, uh, man, there's a lot going on on this board, but it's all functional. Um, and, and in this case, it's also uh, gears that are turning, and some people actually paint their gears up, um, which just makes the game really, really pretty. And, pretty. and there's, again, a lot going, this isn't, none of this is wasted artwork. There's, there's a meaning for each of these things, uh, and yet it, it keeps us engaged perceptually. Uh, this is uh, the village, again, a great layout, um, lots and lots going on here, but every single piece of this is functional, as well as adding to the feeling of, oh, I'm playing in sort of a, a medieval village and, and you know, what's going on there. Um, I mentioned Splendor earlier. The Splendor coins are, are terrific. Um, I mean, lots of games I play, we're all just kind of doing this with the coins, just because it's, it's a really good heft to them. Um, that doesn't change the game, but it does change how you, how you experience the game, how you feel about it. Oh, and then, I don't know if you guys know this game. Um, this is Fugitive, a wonderful little game. Um, the thing, one, yeah. <laughs> one of the things, of many things I love about this game is that the artwork is highly evocative of where you are. So as the numbers get higher, and as you're later in the, the chase, um, it, it's depicting the story sort of of, of where you are in, in the game. And it really gives a good, it helps keep the, 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 the feeling of the tension in the, in the game. So moving past the perceptual, we get to the cognitive part of this, the short-term and long-term cognitive. And this is really where a lot of, I would say maybe most uh, tabletop games is, is sort of the bread and butter. Um, this is what's called executive attention. So the first part was, is reflexive attention. You see a pretty picture, you have a nice heavy coin. That's something that we, we will pay attention to. Executive attention is decisions we're making, plans we're making, goals we have. So it's very focused, and this comes to both short and long-term varieties. Um, incorporates puzzles and, and strategies as well. Um, and then what we tend to do as players is say, I am trying to, you know, uh, in risk, I'm trying to win the game, so I'm trying to take over North America because I know it's the most defensible, so I'm trying to uh, capture a country in Africa as a distraction. So you have these nested goals. This is all very, very cognitive, um, which is great, but on its own it can be kind of dry and kind of fatiguing. And different people have really different thresholds for this. Some people will say, oh, well, real gamers, TM, like, you know, really kind of gnarly games with lots of rules and lots of different strategies and lots of things you can do. And other people, you know, want to play a love letter. Um, and I think, I mean, the thing is games really span that gamut and we as gamers span that gamut. And on some days, yeah, I am definitely up for a big complex game. On other days, I just want to play a very simple game. I mentioned love letter set is another one um, where you, I don't have to be as fatigued by the, the cognitive aspects of that. So the next step out of this in terms of time uh, and resources is social interactivity. Again, a very big thing for, for tabletop games. Though when I started thinking about this, it kind of amazed me as I said how many multiplayer solitaire or quasi-multiplayer solitaire games there are out there where I'm not really playing with other people. 
and it'd be fairly easy for me to play this, the same game with people in different rooms, um, and we're not really interacting a lot. But the games that, uh, I think one of the things that draws people a lot to tabletop games is that they have these, this very powerful social aspect to it. We like to get together and play with our friends. And that's, that's, uh, this has incredibly long-term effects, and I think it's one of the reasons why this becomes a hobby, because we like not just playing these games, but we like playing games with our friends. From there, we go to emotional interactivity, and this is more reflective in terms of the psychological attention, so it's things you think about afterwards. Uh, it takes a lot longer to process. Um, emotions take longer for us to have a longer onset and take longer for us to, to think about uh, than do um, something that, that's very perceptual, even like a short-term puzzle or something like that. There's lots and lots of emotions that you can have in, in games, and um, one of the things I've, I've heard other designers say, and I, I do myself, is when I'm designing a game experience, what I want the player to feel. Uh, one designer has said, I'm not going to ship this game until the player feels blank. And you can ask people, how did you feel playing this game? I felt sorrow. If you play uh, The Grizzled, um, that's a very different experience than playing Love Letter. Um, I'm not shilling for Love Letter, it just keeps coming up. Um, but, and, and actually, I'll add to this. So a game like uh, Tim's Games, Burgle Brothers and uh, Fugitive, to me are masterpieces of emotion. Um, we feel, when we're playing Burgle Brothers, we feel this incredible tension, but it's a very cooperative, we call it Ocean's Eleven the game. Um, but it's this feeling of we're about to die a lot, you know, for, for a long time. And with The Fugitive, it's either they're about to get away or I'm about to get caught for the entire game. And that turns out to be a really effective emotional experience, emotional and, and social experience. From there, we go out to the cultural. This is sort of the, the, the far edges of, of different kinds of interactivity and game design, where you can ask questions like, who are we as a people? What are our values? Um, photosynthesis has something of an ecological aspect to it. You know, you could push that further and say, this is really a game about um, what ecology can do or not do. Um, there's a game that some of you may know, Brendan Romero uh, made. It's more of an art installation game called Train. This is a game about the Holocaust. This is what I said before about there are games that are engaging that aren't necessarily fun. Um, this is not what I would consider to be a fun game, but it, it's a highly impactful game that is definitely engaging. Um, I won't describe it too much, but you are putting little yellow pegs onto trains to take them to their destination. And when people figure out what it is they're doing in this game, they are typically horrified and have lots of reactions to that. So one of the points about all this is that um, we have all these different kinds of interactivity, and we don't often think about how we're applying them in game design. And again, this sort of systemic approach um, can help us understand that players have an interactivity budget. We have only so many mental resources. Not, we talk about cognitive load, but this goes well beyond just cognitive load. Um, this uh, graph here comes from Quantic Foundry, where they have over 300,000 uh, survey results for video games, where they've had people tag games saying, how exciting is this game versus how strategic is this game? And they looked at the data a lot of different ways. And what they found was there's nothing in the upper right-hand quadrant. There's no game that is both really exciting, really fast-paced, and real, real um, strategic. You don't get Europa Universalis colon League of Legends. You know, that's just not going to happen because we don't have the mental resources for it. And what they've been able to do is to say that if you look at these bands, there are games that are hard to play down to games that are really easy to play based on how much of your mental resources uh, you take. And one of the things that they, they also show is that, um, this, that the fast drives out the slow. So if I have games that have um, a lot of uh, perceptual needs or that have a lot of rules I have to remember and a lot of rules exceptions I have to remember, that drives out everything beyond that. It drives out the social side of it, like, hang on, I can't, I can't trade with you, I can't be, you know, interact with you because I'm thinking about this rule, do I really want to do this or not? Um, much less driving out the emotional and the, the uh, cultural side of this. This also leads to um, overload, which we see as analysis paralysis. I'm trying to think about so much, I've used up all my resources, I can't do anything more. So the question for, as game designers is, how are we spending our, our players' budgets? And some of this is, how many rules are you gonna make them read? I love that special flavor of hell. You know, like how many rules are you gonna make them read before they can be engaged in your game? And that's also part of their, their interactivity budget. I wanna switch gears here a little bit and talk um, in just the last few minutes about emergence because this is an, a, a really powerful result of doing systemic game design and any kind of systemic design where you can take looping parts, parts that have behaviors that loop together and create what are called metastable structures. And uh, this is getting really theoretical, I know. Um, it's the idea that um, in a, um, a school of fish or a flock of birds, the flock is not described, or the school of fish is not described by any particular fish. There, there are qualities that the flock has that no individual bird has in that flock. 
Um, same thing with a hurricane or a termite's nest or a society or anything else. Um, there's a, a new whole at a higher level of organization that is greater than the sum of its parts. And this is how we get this, this systemic hierarchy I mentioned earlier. The tricky part of this is that the emergence isn't in the part, but results from what you get from the interaction. So if I wanted to build a game about um, making a forest, my parts would be trees, but I gotta make this in such a way that the players can create a forest and see that forest literally emerge as part of the game. And that turns out to be something that is incredibly fascinating to us as humans. We do this all the time. I mean, in everything from how we you know, codify relationships in our societies to how we look at the stars and see constellations. These are all looking for emergence all the time. So building emergence is, um, for me, sort of where the, the frontier is. Um, what I've, some of the things I've, I've looked to and discovered is that there are, I think, and I'm sort of putting out this, this out there as a hypothesis at this point, if you create behaviors in your parts that are local, meaning that the, the parts only affect each other that are, that are nearby, both geographic and or, geographically and organizationally. So if I have an orc in a forest who uh, kills a squirrel, that doesn't call the castle, cause the castle walls to fall down. That would be non-local interaction. But it might cause the squirrel population to fall, which can cause other things to happen. Uh, they're modular, which means they're internal. Uh, they don't require additional context. A different thing doesn't happen if, if, squirrel, if, if the orc kills a squirrel, the orc kills a fox, that might cause different ecological things to happen, but it doesn't cause a different behavior to happen. And they're generic, so that they, um, you know, the orc swinging the sword is going to have the same kind of effect. It's not going to make the squirrel healthier, because that would, that's having a, a, a non-generic behavior. If you get these kinds of behaviors then and on your parts, this is a great setup for building emergence. Now, what is maddening about emergence is that there is no formula for this. There's nothing that says, if you do these things, boom, you got emergence. These will lead to it, they'll tend toward it, but, but there's nothing that, that we know that says this is the exact recipe. Um, just to give you a quick example of simple emergence, this is two balls, now three, all they're doing is going back and forth. But watch what happens as, they, as we get a few more in there. So all we're doing is adding in local, simple, generic behaviors of these balls going back and forth on their own, on their own diameter axis. Now, what you as a human are seeing is something new emerge. So the question is, is that rotating circle really there or not? And this is, the kind of, you, this is where you get into reductionist versus holistic arguments. Um, this will go back to it. And there's a shift there too, if you notice that. Now it looks like it's rotating around the, the center of the circle and then it starts over again. I have a ton of these. <laughs> uh, I took all the rest of them out of the talk. Uh, but this is how you, you can create emergence from really, really simple parts. Um, there are a lot of different things we see at Games of Emergence. Go is a fantastic example. Simple, simple rules, but tons of stuff going on there. Chess, certainly. Uh, rock, paper, lizard, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock even has some in it as well. Um, the thing about building emergence is that um, you need to have parts that have uh, recombinable pieces, again, these behaviors that are local, generic, and modular. So um, having the, um, the board in, in Settlers of Catan, that I, that I, you know, a, a tile laying game that I put out a new board every time, is going to lead to more emergence than will a fixed board like in Power Grid. Now, that, what that means is I have a broader play space, I have more games that can be played. There are only, you know, you're not going to change relationships between the different cities in Power Grid. What that also means, though, is that the relationships between, relationships between the cities and power grid can be tested, can be balanced. You can know, yes, this should have a cost of 11 and this should have a cost of 14. We've played it a lot, we know that. If it's emergent, you know, in, in Settlers, we've had games that are like, this is a terrible board. We should never play this one again. Um, in Burgle Brothers, we've had many times we said, this is not a three-story building, this is a two-story building because the board screwed us. Um, so that, you know, there, there's, there's ups and downs there. There is, um, some hypotheses, I want to say theory, um, that the more abstract you make the parts and the behaviors, so in a game like Go, uh, or this is Conway's life over here on the right, um, that it's easier to balance and easier to get emergence, but the tricky thing there is it turns out that Conway's life actually exists on a knife edge. It's kind of a miracle that it works at all. If you change the rules, how many of you guys know Conway's life? Okay. Um, if you change the rules just like the rules here are, are on the right, so from one generation to the next, does a cell turn on or turn off? If you change those rules just slightly, so you say instead of having um, three cells around me, um, if there are, there are two cells around me, there is a 20% chance that the cell will turn on. 
If there's four cells running, there's a 20% chance it will turn off. If you change this just slightly, it doesn't work anymore. And it's really fascinating to me anyway. Maybe that's a very geeky thing. But it does sit on this knife edge, and we see this a lot. There's a, a whole lot of work that's been done on, on um, emergence happening at the edge of chaos. So you go too far to one side of chaos, too far to this side, you have you know, nothing exciting. This to me feels like very deep relationships, uh, relationships to game as well, to games and game design. The thing is that if you're trying to build emergence, you can't just say, oh great, I'll just make a game that has really abstract parts and simple rules and I'll have wonderful emergence. It doesn't work that way and we kind of don't know why. I mean, there's things we can poke at, but it's, there's more, more work to be done there. Okay, so how do you get started with all this? Um, we've had this question a couple times already today, which is, I think is wonderful. Um, my view on this is to start where you're comfortable. Um, if you are, um, well, just to jump down to the bottom of this, I, I separate out my students into storytellers, inventors, and toy makers. I actually line them up in the room. We talk about what they, what they like to do, what their, where their ideas come from. If you're a storyteller, you're one of those people, probably a lot of people in the room here, who have, um, I do like, oh, I want to make a game about uh, a forest that gradually goes through these changes, and, and then there's ham sandwiches, because we talked about that earlier. Um, you know, there's, if, you're talking, if you're talking at that level, you're a storyteller, and that's, that's great. Um, if you are talking about uh, what's often, game designers talk about the nouns and verbs. What are the parts? What are their behaviors? You're a toy maker. I often have students who will say, hey, I've got this really cool thing. Look, it's a ball, and it rolls around, and it changes color. I'm like, okay, that's cool for about 15 seconds. What's the game? I have no idea. Had a student who said, I want to make a game about superheroes who don't know what their powers are. Okay, sounds good. Good storytelling stuff. What are the nouns and verbs? I have no idea. Um, and in the middle you have this, this sort of system-y inventor type. So this is, um, th these are the Petri dishes from, um, from, power, from, power, from uh, Pandemic, which don't really add to the game functionally, but they add to the, the experience of the game. Um, in terms of the, uh, the systems part of it, uh, Tim introduced me to these uh, cube towers, which are fascinating because you put some cubes in and different cubes come out. It's a really cool little subsystem. How would I use that in a game? I've got about a million ideas. And I don't know if any of them are any good. Um, I actually have an idea for a game that I've had since the early 90s when we were contracted to make a game based on a toy uh, where you start off growing plants that later become the parts of animals. It's this middle part of a game. I don't really know, it's not really plants and animals and I don't really know what the game is, but it's this middle systems part. I've, ha I've kept it with me because it feels cool, but I don't know, I don't know what the game is yet. Um, and then you've got the, the, the parts themselves. Um, years ago I worked at, at Maxis and was working on a new version of SimCity where we wanted to give people the feeling, the experience of what is it like to live with a bunch of other people and work with other people in SimCity. And it, that was my take on it because I'm more of a storyteller. Um, Will Wright, wonderful, famous designer. I won't say we almost came to blows. It was the only thing we ever had that was close to an argument where he's like, but what are the nouns and verbs? Because he, he was all about the parts. He was all about the nouns and verbs. SimCity, a lot of people don't know this, is a wonderful game that was made entirely in terms of the, the parts and their interactions. SimCity 3000, when I joined Maxis, was just shipping. And that game was not, I hope I'm not telling too many stories. This is an old story. Uh, that game was not playable a few weeks before it shipped. It had all the parts, had all the behaviors, had even all the systems, but there was no experience because that wasn't where Will lived. He's definitely a toy maker. So these are all great. Toy makers, inventors, and storytellers, awesome. Start where you live and branch out from there. Um, more parts. Um, so you know, I'll come back to that point in just a minute here, but in terms of, of getting started, the thing that I found that works really well is to make that interactive loop. What is the player doing? What are, the, what are their intentions? What do they do in the game? How does it change the state of the game? How does the game feed back, that back to the player to give them some new intentions? The faster I can get to that in a prototype, the more certain I am that I actually have a game, as opposed to kind of a cool idea. Um, and in my opinion, it's really not a game without that loop in there. Um, and this is something that, again, I see with my students over and over again having trouble saying, well, I've got this cool idea, okay, what does the player do? Oh, well, I'll make the player do this, or the player will do this. Like, man, as soon as someone says the player will do this, like, hmm, I don't know, man. Uh, you, you know, and I had a group of students who had a really cool idea at first. I said, okay, let's see where this goes. And it drained right down to, it was a visual novel where the player pressed the space bar. The player, quote unquote, plus, plus the space bar. No decisions, no state, no, nothing else going on. So. In terms of getting started, you want to get to that loop as fast as you can. 
And that means prototyping as fast and ugly as you can while preserving the theme. If you are an artist, man, if you can do visual art, ooh, do that. If you can go on Google without going into a wiki spiral and spending a week searching for just the right reference art, not that I've ever done that. Um, but preserve the theme, but get to something fast and ugly. Um, and then and try and as much as you can stay true to that starting point while understanding that it may need to change. Um, so the, the, the final part of this is that seeing the parts, loops, and the holes, the experience, the systems, and the, the parts themselves all at the same time. This to me is the hardest part and to me the most in, almost intoxicating part about being a game designer is seeing all these things at the same time. I want players to have this experience, therefore I know that has to be a plus two, not a plus three, so that it falls to this thing so the players get that thing, you know, have this, this feeling appear. And so what that means to me is that whether you're starting as a storyteller, inventor, or a toy maker, it doesn't really matter because you're gonna have to have all three at the same time. Okay, so just to sum up, in terms of systemic game design, we're creating games with parts and behaviors that connect to form looping structures that then connect with the player to create a new system using all these different kinds of interactions I mentioned uh, to, to work with the player's psychology. Um, and then to, I think, hopefully create emergent systems. And finally, I would say to realize that systems go beyond, far beyond making games. And this is why I think tabletop games have a really unique opportunity. I really believe that better systems make better games and ultimately that thinking in systems makes for better game designers and for better people. Um, one of the things I've said a few times is that systems thinking is the 21st century, but literacy was the 20th century. You can get by for the first few decades of the 20th century without really being fully literate. You can get by right now without really knowing how to think in systems. But if the financial crisis was a surprise to you, if the looming consumer debt crisis that hasn't really hit yet is a surprise to you, if climate change is a surprise to you, you're not thinking in systems. And I'm not trying to sound accusatory about that. But the more we can think in systems, the better prepared we are right down to things like the tsunami in Bande Aceh, uh, which killed a few hundred thousand people. There were people when the waters receded, they ran up onto the beach because they thought it'd be great beach combing, not understanding the system at work. When the water runs out that far, that means a really big wave is coming. So you need to be able to see the systems around you. So I think that games provide us a really unique way to see and to think and to inhabit and experience systems. And I think that, that tabletop games have a really unique opportunity here because we can pass these systems along to players and say, oh, this is what it means to take an adventure. This is what it means to open a deli. This is what it means to try and pass on a love letter to a, a princess. But to think about these things as systems rather than just as, oh, it's this, this random assortment of, of things I'm doing. That's it. Thanks very much.